Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Illinois Authors. And we're really, really delighted to be joined by one of the most powerful and evocative writers in the country today, Margot Jefferson, who's a professor of writing at Columbia University School of Arts. Um, professor Jefferson is from Chicago. We're going to talk an awful lot about that. Um, she earned a, a, a bachelor's degree at Brandeis, a master's degree at Columbia S School of Journalism, uh, launched a really wonderful career in journalism and writing. She began as a staff writer for Newsweek, uh, was a freelancer and then a staff writer for the New York Times. At the New York Times, she won a Pulitzer Prize for her uh, some articles on, on, cr on criticism and book reviews. Um, and then she had turned uh, to, to writing books. She's written two really terrific books. The first one on Michael Jackson, which came out in 2005. And the second one, a memoir that came out in 2015, Negro Land, which has won many, many awards um, and is just a, a marvel of, of, of description and self-revelation. I just can't wait to talk to her about it. Um, this book, by the way, was mentioned by the New York Times as one of the 50 best memoirs of the last half century. And Professor Jefferson joins us from her home in New York City. So good morning, Professor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Well, girl. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about your career as a writer. I, you, you went, uh, well, we'll talk a lot about Chicago in a few minutes, but you went to Brandeis University. Um, at that point, were you pretty certain that you wanted a career in writing or, or how did that develop? I wasn't. Um, I had always written well, you know, teachers and whatever had told me that I knew it. Um, I, you know, dabbled in a little short story writing, a little whatever, but I had, you know, I hadn't been involved in journalism until I really, in my early 20s, I, you know, I was a young woman in New York, um, thinking about my future. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, um, uh, what do I do well? You know, I, I dabbled with wanting to be an actress. I turned against that. And I, I thought, you know, I, I write well, but what do I want to do with it? And it really came to me, you know, I've been reading um, a lot of, it was interesting, the few years before I went to Columbia, I began, instead of reading so much fiction and poetry, I began reading the, the nonfiction, the essays, the journalism of m major writers, you know. Um, and I thought, oh, I, I, wanna be, I wanna be involved to some extent in the here and now, and that's journalism. But I, I'm not a reporter in that way. I wanna be, I wanna be a critic, you know. I, I wanna be involved with the culture and the arts. Um, as they are changing and growing. And, you know, this was, um, I got out of college in 68. I went to um, Columbia J School in 1970. Um, uh, ironically enough, my last job before I went to J School thinking of current events was, I was a secretary, like so many young women who came to New York at Planned Parenthood, New York. So, uh, so in any case, you know, it was really Columbia that, you know, it did what a graduate program should. It really taught me, you know, the the the, the key elements of my craft and, and made me be serious. And did you focus on criticism then when you were studying it? At, at I Columbia? did. There's a program, you know, that everybody follows, you know, when you learn real, you know, basics of reporting and feature writing. Um, we even had a little broadcast training. So, you know, there is a there's a curriculum that you all follow, but um, my second semester, our second semester, we, we got to specialize and um, I was lucky. They were just starting um, criticism, um, write workshops there that year. They hadn't done them before, you know, partly because, again, 68, 69, 70, the arts were, you know, having a big, big, big boom. So I was able um, to, uh, and in my magazine, writing workshops. I got to focus on art. Well, then when you started at Newsweek, was it something that you had like a regular beat and then you could do arts or was arts your, your arts beat? That's how I started. That was a couple of years later. So what I did um, getting out of um, Columbia is um, free, fiercely, free, fiercely freelance, you know, because that's also how you 
get. You're not going to get a job if you in, in journalism if you don't have clips, as we call them, pieces that you've published to show people. So, you know, I um, in that way, coming out of Columbia was useful. I, um, I got to, you know, I had professors who would say, oh, write so and so, you know, and, and do pitch a query letter. So I got to publish in Harper's Magazine and the Washington Post, um, in Ms. And I, then I had those clips when I found out that the Times was hiring. They were hiring in both the arts section and what was called back of the book, a lot of lifestyle, you know, fashion and science and da 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 da. So I did a round of interviews and it was clear that, you know, my my specialty was art. So I was hired as the, I was the junior um, of three, there have always been three, always. For years, there'd been three book reviewers at Newsweek. Um, one of them had left and that's when I, so I came in as, as the third book reviewer and I was able to sometimes do arts features. Um, you know, I remember doing one on Linda Ronstadt and, you know, one on um, movie called Cooley High. And so, yeah, so my beat was always um, arts. And initially for, for the five years I was at Newsweek, the focus was on books as the focus was on books when I first went to the Times, you know, because my background had also been in literature. in college. Right. Well, let me just read a couple sentences. You talked about uh, your life as a critic, and that's part of your kind of identity and how you view the world. And you write, clever of me to become a critic. We critics scrutinize and show off to a higher end for a greater good. Our manners, our tastes, our declarations are welcomed, superior for life, except when we're not, except when we're dismissed or denounced as envious and petty, as derivatives and dependents by nature, second class for life. Talk about just the sensibility of a critic. I mean, and, and even, I mean, for us, you know, now, I mean, when you go to a movie or watch a play, I mean, does, is it sort of, is there a critical uh, part of your brain that kind of activates or can you suspend it or how does that no, work? It's, it's No, it's an interesting question. Um, I think more and more as I, as I wrote criticism, and that's you know, kind of what the, the ironies of that passage about, oh, you think you're the omniscient narrator, you think you're so powerful, it's got its limits. More and more um, as I wrote, I realized that what you've got going, you know, when you walk into a play or even start reading a book or go to a movie, you're, you're, you're double, you're, you're like double, jo double jointed in the mind. Uh, one part of your, of you, of your sensibility of your mind is really doing what the audience does. You're reacting, you know, what does that look like? You're taking in, you know, um, all the, all the visuals, the orals, but your senses are really responding. Uh, and that's important because you are partly standing in for, you know, whoever the, the viewer reading you or thinking about going to this is, you know, so that's one part of you. And then another part of you um, is, oh, what, you know, okay, this is a, this is a, this is a Western. That, that's the form that I'm thinking of, you know, there's this new Jane Campion movie. Yeah. Okay, what's the genre? It's a Western, but it's a you know, it's very complicated and innovative in certain ways in terms of style and the history of Westerns and the plot is very different. So, you know, you're analyzing it in those ways. What's her style as a filmmaker? Um, oh, you know, this, this scene is striking me. Yeah, I, it, maybe it's too melodramatic. Let me just write a note, you know, to myself, is that, you know, or well, I'm confused here. What does that mean? So, you know, you really are doing, you're doing both. Interesting. And you're taking notes and then you're, you know, putting it all together after. Also dependent on how much you know. Sometimes you go to things. Sometimes you, you, you know, let's say I'm at a movie and it's, it's a director, it's actors, it's a style, maybe it's rom-com, maybe it's whatever, that I really know well. Um, that's going to change my tone. Um, if I'm going to a movie or a play, completely new writer, you know, new experience for me, not a form I know well, um, then I'm going to be more of a, of a first time viewer. I'm not going to fake it, you know? Um, yeah. 
Well, I, I, I've read some of your book reviews, and they are tremendous. And you know, they were a number of them were cited for your your Pulitzer Prize. And I, I was I, I particularly loved your uh, book review you did on Nelson Mandela's autobiography. And I don't expect mm-hmm. you to remember the review, but I just wanted to read I'm a couple of sentences. Freedom, though, that was the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you say Nelson Mandela has all has already made history. Now he has chosen to write it in the form of an autobiography. Then you say later. His book is formal in in tone, courtly, stern, ironic, and its detailed accounts of political meetings and strategy didactic. It is also fascinating because, like the hero in a Shakespearean history play, Mr. Mandela cannot help revealing himself. Here are all the idiosyncrasies and complications that turned a man into a leader and that have at last turned that leader back into a man. Uh, what a wonderful way of structuring the review. But d- d- talk more broadly about reviews, because it seems like there's a lot of genres. Some, you know, take a review as kind of licensed to just hold forth on the broad topic of the book. Others, you know, do a very kind of, you know, almost point by point analysis of the book and then assessment. For you, it seems like your essays are just both really substantive, but also quite literary and thematic. Um, thank you for that. Um you know, we all do have, I mean, we have our sensibilities. And, you know, if you're writing week after week, it's in that way a little bit like being a performer in an ongoing TV series. You, you know, you your style, certain elements of your style and the approach, the, like the examples you just gave, become, you know, p- part of your practice and they become evident. Uh, I, I try to adapt to some extent, you know, because there's certain elements. There's the story, you know, there's the writer. In the case of someone like Mandela, you know, there is the life of a figure quite outside the book. Um, So I I have always tried to adapt my approach in some way to what the the needs and what the form of the book as book and also, you know, as having a particular place in a a culture. that it and also some certain ways in which you write have to do with the with the content and um, of the book, let's say, and the history it evokes. That that line about you know circumstances in politics made him a leader. Now we see the leader become a man. I had actually had in my head um, two lines from Frederick Douglass's um, autobiography where he says, "You have seen." how a man was made a slave. Now you shall see how a slave becomes a man. And that, it just pleased me, but I think it was also that I wanted um, access to a more formal language that I felt suit, suits his temperament as well as his, his place um, in history. Well, will you talk about shifting more to, I mean, I know you continue to write essays and so forth, but you moved also into the realm of book writing. And you said, uh, my ambitions as a writer to do more got fiercer and fiercer. Talk about that. And I mean, we could spend a whole session talking about your Michael Jackson book, which is an astonishingly provocative and interesting book. I want to focus mostly on Negro land, but just talk about just your shift to, 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 to book writing. Okay. Well, you know, the book always hangs over. Um, (laughs) Some kind of book hangs over most writers, you know, because it's such a clear, you know, in every profession, there are clear markers of I'm going forward or I'm taking on a different kind of challenge. Um, And, you know, if you are um, a review writer, an essay writer, you know, a reporter, feature, you know, if you're working in these smaller, shorter forms, then the book you know, is, is looming as an ambition, but I think I, I got, it got fiercer, my ambition to do it. Uh, And here's one reason why it's an, it's an analogy, but it, and it has to do with something I just mentioned. I spoke of how your style can become, your style takes on certain repeating characteristics that are rather like um, the performance, you know, of a, of an actor in an ongoing series, that character is created, you know, and and there are familiar gestures, vocal, you know, ways of talking, laughing. That's what happens when you are um, writing at the same length and same speed uh, in the same general area, week after week, year after year. You do, you know, you fall into a way of ways of writing, thinking. Um, 
a performance in a sense, it doesn't change very much. And I began to feel, I mean, to some extent you can't, I began to feel that I was getting stuck. You know, I was not writing badly, but just in the same way, repeating myself. And that there were always subjects, ways of thinking about, um, you know, a performer or whatever, um, or a piece of art or a cultural trend that I never quite had enough room for. Um, there's also just timing, you know, if you're meeting weekly or monthly deadlines, that's where your energy is going. Um, and there's always interesting material that won't fit into 1500 words or 800 words or 2500. So over the years, um, that collected. And I just felt, you know, I, I have to push myself and try. It always comes down to whether it's the actor leaving a series for a movie, you know, or for a play, trying theater for the first time, um, or a book. It's all, you know, what haven't I done? What maybe am I a little scared of? Um, what do I admire in what other writers have done? What do I envy? You know, and how do I turn all of that into into a book and, you know, in, into the process of, of working um, on a book. Well, your memoir, you, you, you mentioned in some interviews, you worked on over about five years, maybe 2008, nine to 2014. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with some, with some breaks. Um, and also she said, teaching, I found a little yeah. defensive teaching full time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I mean, the title of course commands attention. Tell us about the title and what, how it came to you and what it means, you know, for people who have not yet read your book, why? Why I would pick a title um, like Negro Land. Um, okay. Um, first of all, a little historical context, which has a lot to do with it. Um, I was born in 1947. Um, right around that year, the word Negro, um, which had at that point, was the chosen and preferred word for what we now call Black or African-American people. Previously, right before Negro, um, the preferred term, meaning the respectable and respectful term, had been colored. Um, think of the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. You know, I think you can all see, you and I both know this, you know, part of, of, of the progress um, of a group, the backward and forward move always has to do with um, names, among other things, with what they're called. Um, you know, are you Hispanic? Are you Latino? Are you Latinx? Um, you know, what Asian American means exactly what? Because there's East Asia, there's South Asia. So this has always been, you know, you many of you know, for example, all the insulting words that have been thrown around for centuries um, about, about Black people. So names are absolutely crucial. I started using in my own uh, mind the word Negro land probably when I was in my 40s. And it had to do with I was not living at home anymore, to say the least. My parents and all their friends who had been so much, who'd been crucial to shaping this very particular world. Um, they were much older, some of them were dying. And, and so the word for me um, was almost like naming a country, you know? Um, countries too changed their names and, and it caught um, to me, that that, prog that 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 movement from before I was born, really a whole 20th century history um, of this particular, well, of all people, of, of all Black people, but also of this particular group who called themselves um, the Negro elite, um, part of the larger world of African Americans, but also um, you know, so, uh, setting themselves apart in certain ways. Again, the way a country or a land may designate itself as connected to, but somewhat, but apart from its neighbors. I wanted the word land also because uh, so much of American history has involved a degree of physical and social and political um, 
racial segregation. That means, you know, to move, to move from one neighborhood that's white to a neighborhood that's black can and still does feel like moving literally from one land or one country to another. So I wanted that. I wanted to, to you know, evoke um, all of all of those things. You have said in Negro land, we thought of ourselves as a third race, poised between masses of Negroes and all classes of of Caucasians. Talk about this. This, um, you know, the affluent, well educated, you know, extraordinarily successful generation that your folks, your parents embodied. You know, I'm being a little bit ironic there, um, fortunately, and somewhat critical, um, though also, you know, though there's, a, there is much to admire and honor there, but there was um, in that world, as in the world of all elites, but maybe especially elites that, that are, have set themselves up, are, are, are within groups that suffer a lot of discrimination and prejudice. There was extreme um, awareness, consciousness of, of every aspect of your behavior and how in some way, you know, from things like, you know, doing well in school and finding a career to having, if you were a girl, really nice manners and, you know, and being kind of perky, but also genteel. Um, you know, there were, it was almost like a, a kind of guidebook. We were, you know, kind of brought into and educated in being members of this privileged group that we were taught white society um, always you know, did its best to ignore or not to acknowledge or to disdain. And we were also taught that we were important forces in countering by our very existence, the stereotypes and the prejudices um, about black people. So, you know, every, every personal, um, <laughs> your personal path was also designated um, a kind of sociological and historical path. And that, that old fashioned word, um, uplift, you know, was very much um, the question. And, and from the smallest um, little behavioral motifs, you know, to large, uh, large choices, including politics, um, you know, you were you were a group example as much as you were an individual. Well, and, I mean, you put it perfectly in an interview I read in which you said um, so much of being a privileged black person is executing a series of performances. Manners mm -hmm. are a performance. This is so true of my childhood. You've been told that implicitly or explicitly anytime you walk outside, the way you speak, the way you dress, your diction, all of this is going to some way signify our place as a people on the larger stage of American society, that is performance. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes, you, <laughs> I wish you'd read that before I spoke. <laughs> it's, very, it's very clear, yeah, that's, that's right. Performance, um, you know, always with the immediate goal in sight, which was sometimes very selfish, you know, I'm gonna accumulate this, I'm gonna be rewarded with that and was also at the same time supposed to be, and sometimes was, um, for the greater good um, of, well, of your people, yeah. Well, I, a huge, uh, uh, you're wonderful in evoking your family, your, your immediate family, your parents, your father, Ronald, was a uh, pediatrician and actually a head of pediatrics at Provident Hospital. Your mom was a social worker. Um, your sister, Denise, was three or four years older, was a force of nature. Um, uh, tell just us about to, just, just to add my, my sister, um, passed in 2008. So I just want to say she, um, was for 20 years, for those of you who are dance and theater fans, the director of the Alvin Ailey school. So oh, wow. Yeah. But so, I mean, you, you some wonderful stories about your family growing up and, and many of them positive, but the one that really, uh, that kind of uh, struck me the hardest was a, a, an account you make of a trip that you guys took, I think it was in the summer of 56 and you went to Quebec city, Montreal, New York city, ended up in Atlantic city. And then you had this amazingly jarring, uh, clash with America of that time. Talk about that moment. Yeah, um, that, that you have set it up perfectly. Um, we had had, you know, 
Americans or on the road in their cars in the 50s. So it was a very typical kind of trip. And we've had a very, very good time, um, maybe particularly in Canada, but you know, we hadn't been there before. Atlantic City was supposed to be the last few days of the trip. You go to the beach, you relax, you know, you whatever, unwind. Um, we got there um, and my mother had made all these reservations well in advance and had confirmations. When we arrived, the four of us, um, the desk clerk um, insisted he didn't have um, our reservations. So my parents, you know, no, please look again. Who was it? You know, what was the name again? Um, Dr. and Mrs. Ronald Jefferson. He said, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Jefferson? No, Dr. Ronald Jefferson. So he painstakingly, he's already gone down the guest list um, and said we weren't there. Very excruciatingly slowly, you know, with a little sigh. He goes back down it again. Oh, yes, here you are, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, I don't remember if either of my parents corrected him again and said, Dr. Jefferson, though I remember my mother saying at some point, even after that, no, a lot of white people just don't like to acknowledge you might be a doctor. Anyway, he clerk said, all right, I'll have your, um, you know, follow the, um, the bell boy, he'll take your luggage up. Um, we went up and up and up um, and finally got taken into this scroungy little room. We'd been, we could see from the lobby of the hotel that there were plenty of other nice rooms. Um, it was kind of dusty, it was on a corner, it looked out on, God, did it look out on a fire escape? I can't, but you know, no view whatsoever. Um, when we, um, I and my parents got quieter and quieter. And my sister and I were kind of mm, cheerful, not cheerfully, but not take, choosing not to quite take it in. But we could, as kids always can, we could sense the mood was plunging and something was going wrong. Um, when we were bathing for dinner, my mother checked the bathtub and it wasn't fully clean. So it didn't seem as if the room had been cleaned before we came in. Um, to make um, a shorter story than my sister and I, who'd been looking forward to the beach, thought it would be, um, to make it even shorter, we left, um, I believe the next day. We went out to the beach that afternoon with this loom um, or hanging. Um, at some point, I think, I think we decided to order dinner in our room, room service, and my sister and I started pouting about that. Um, and my father was in the other room. My mother said, this is a prejudiced hotel. <laughs> they have treated us very badly. We are not going into their dining room and we are leaving tomorrow. Uh, so we did, we went home. I've, I've wondered, neither of my parents, um, neither of them's alive, so I can't ask. There is a book that's gotten um, a fair amount of attention in recent years. It was a book put together by um, black people would have been in the era of Negroes, um, Negroes rather than black people with warnings and alerts um, and advice about good places to stay if you were taking a road trip. I don't know if my parents didn't have that book or didn't consult it. I know they had talked to friends. So, you know, maybe the policy of the hotel had changed, but there it, but there it was, yeah. And they, well, this, this often, this was very typical. Um, of public accommodations. And again, that, that discrimination has a long history um, across social, you know, whether it's a little, little coffee shop or a fancy restaurant, you were always having to check out which places were not going to accept you or were gonna make you wait and wait and wait and then give you the worst table possible or had so-called, you know, had supposedly opened up. Yeah, I mean, you end that story very powerfully by saying, we drive back to Chicago, an American family returning from the kind of vacation successful American families have. Only Atlantic City went wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one of the looming uh, entities. Well, I must also say, um, I do remember one of the tensions, and I'm sure some of you have read this in other memoirs or, or social histories, one of the tensions for any Black family on a cross-country road trip was also which gas stations would be 
perfectly respectful about your using their bathroom if you had to stop, which if you've got two kids in the car, you have to do sometimes. So yeah. that was also, you know, a subject of sotto voce discussion in the front seat. Or a couple of times I just remember being told, Margo, please, you just have to wait. <laughs> you know, we're not going to stop in this. You know, no, that's not a place we're going to stop. Yeah. All right. Well, that- well, no, I mean, the one thing, uh, many, many parts of the book I loved, and, uh, you know, for, t- for our audience, your evocation of Chicago in the 1950s, early 1960s is just remarkable. And, and you talk about, you know, just sort of the kind of wonderful moments of uh, you and your sister were at summer camp at the Illinois uh, Forest Preserve. Yeah, you went Palos to, Park it was, yeah. Right. You went to ballets and, you know, as they came. And operas and jazz clubs. It was, yeah, yeah. And there but was a, also, a very active all-Black social life, which was fun, you know, clubs. And there was a, um, a ho- all-Black hotel called the Parkway Ballroom that, you know, it was just a delight. Um, it was in Bronzeville to go to. Well, yeah, but you you write that Chicago then was a, quote, fiercely segregated city. Um, talk about how that was manifest. I mean, you've, you've begun to talk about your community of Bronzeville. Um, and, and, and the sheer fact of knowing. I, I loved going to the Parkway Ballroom, but it was also there. It had been built, you know, because there were, we wanted one of our own. And that was um, that's partly what every social group wants. But obviously, that was it was a very deliberate reaction. These all black restaurants and spaces to the fact that you weren't going to be um, welcomed or even in or entertained or tolerated in all manner of um, white public ad- accommodation, white spaces. So I would say, um, you know, when I was a little girl, it was just pleasurable. Um, you know, it's very nice to be in neighborhoods and a world where your parents know, you know, people who run this deli or they know, you know, every doctor I ever went to was a friend of my father's. Uh, so, you know, the, the larger world and, and the smaller intimate world felt congenial and, um, and supportive and warm. Um, I, uh, my sister and I started going to um, a largely white school. There was always a small collection of blacks. Um, uh, attached to the University of Chicago, the lab school. When um, I was in kindergarten and she was in second grade, um, I will tell you, this is in the book. Um, I don't remember because I had not gone to nursery school. I had insisted I wanted to stay home. So this was my first exposure to what was largely a group of all white kids, but you know, it was didn't seem strange to me. My sister had gone for nursery school and for first grade to an all, um, a private all black school. And she told me some years later that she was really a little taken aback, not scared, but just rattled. And I said, well, tell me exactly why didn't you say? She said, well, for one thing, the boys had bangs. <laughs> and I said, okay, Denise, but I've seen pictures of your all black nursery school. And there are plenty of kids in that picture that looked white, even though they were from me, were families. She said, Mario, they weren't all together. They didn't didn't completely dominate and they didn't have bangs. And I thought, you know, it's such a good example of those seemingly very small, but intense ways in which a child registers difference and a new environment that even if it's cordial, which the lab school was, is more formal, is more watchful, and you you take in that you are not the norm there. So that's what we were always um, negotiating. This, you know, taking our black world um, for granted, even as we had pride in it, um, taking parts of this white world we were integrating, being able when it went well to take that to a good extent for granted. I mean, did I have lots of friends? Did we kind of go to each other's houses? Yes. Um, Were my parents very good at discerning which parents were really welcoming us and which ones weren't? So then we wouldn't do that again, or maybe we wouldn't accept the invitation if the tone of voice wasn't welcome. Yes. Um, It also depends how much you overhear um, when you're growing up. 
you know, at its at its best, I was um, participating in um, what's that old diagram you draw? Where here are two separate worlds, but there's this space. The Venn that, diagram. You know, or, yeah, where yeah, they overlap. And I was participating in that, and I'm glad that I was. Um, so I did get to see, I did get to fully experience um, my corner of Black Chicago, and its equivalent corners portions of white Chicago um and that was that was that was very good um you know it it it's also required performances and it required a certain um you know self-consciousness um and parsing always of what the particular rules and laws and you know favorite habits were in each world well, I loved at one point you say, so we, lab, we, so we lab Negroes would leave the white city of the lab, cross the midway and take one or usually two buses to our faux exotic homes and ethnographic settlements, settlements of Bronzeville, Park Manor and Chatham. Yes. And, you know, I'm partly deliberately using the language of the World's Fair, the Chicago right. World's Fair, where the, the midway, you know, was the place where you know, Scott Joplin and jazz and fair, you know, the, the so-called unlicensed, um, often minority art was. But it, this was also my way of saying, um, you know, back to the word, the word Negro land, you crossed the midway. We were all living, maybe with one or two exceptions, we were all living, um, we, we Blacks at the lab school in, an, in all Black neighborhoods. There may have been, a, there were a few fam, Black families in Hyde Park, which at that point was the only nominally racially integrated neighborhood in Chicago. The majority of us were living in all Black neighborhoods and we crossed the Midway, this big division um, to take our buses back to our um, all Black neighborhoods. And our white friends, whom we've been, you know, having, you know, fun with and studying with all day they went you know to their all white neighborhoods and in those ways never the twain shall meet yeah well you write of hyde park and you say hyde park has always been known to make its citizens feel that their daring is at bottom stable reassuring that they've earned it by standing firm against suburban blandishments and choosing the urban way talk about hyde park um, Hyde Park was is is very interesting that way. My family moved there in about 1962. Um, there had been um, black families. One of I think the first one being Lorraine Hansberry's family there before. But Hyde Park was always very touchy about its nearness to um, working class white, but most particularly to black neighborhoods. And it was always very aware um, that this nearness might not, um, not, not benefit the, uh, the, the, the popularity and the prestige as they saw it, um, and the attraction to white students around the country. It might not benefit the University of Chicago. So at a certain point, they decided to control um, integration um, to let a certain number invite strategize so that a certain number percentage of upper middle class black families who in that way were akin sociologically to the white families to let them in to certain parts of Hyde Park Kenwood. Um, this was also done by um, urban renewal quote unquote which you know one used to call we used to call urban removal um, whereby, Black families and many Black families, especially work, working class ones and working class white neighborhoods, uh, families were bought out and pushed out into other neighborhoods. So, you know, Hyde Park could kind of create as ideal as possible, um, uh, you know, a very stable, controlled integration by um, class means, um, et cetera. Um, so that's that's what it was, and yes, my family did decide to to move there. Um, you know that was a was a mark of status. It was you know, uh, and I I enjoyed my life there. Um, I, you know, I but I had mostly by that time I was maybe fourteen. I had spent you know all my childhood in um, Park Manor. Um, all of you know it was Park Manor or it was Chatham or you know, yeah, right. 
Well, I mean, your book came out to rave reviews and, um, you know, won many awards. And so what was it like as a critic yourself to read um, book reviews of your book? I mean, I saw some uh, Tracy Smith wrote an amazing review in the New York Times. There's other one. What was it like? I mean, did you I don't mean this kind of in a rhetorical way, but did you learn something from the reviews or were they just sort of saying, okay, yeah, they sort of caught that or uh, talk about Several things, because all, you know, I got a lot of really good reviews for which I am very grateful. I didn't get all, you know, I got some, I got some criticisms, even with, I got, yeah, even within, in many ways, good reviews. And I got, I, I, nobody tore me apart, but I certainly had dissenters and, you know, um, when you are, have been a critic yourself, you are partly thinking before you read reviews, ooh, karma, what's, <laughs> what's, what's going to be happening? Um, I would say two things. Um, you can learn something from, and that's, that's useful for me to remember as a critic, you know, from an intelligent review, even when, you know, it, it, is, it is literally critical. Um, that's going to depend on your ego at that particular moment that you're reading, but also on the um, the effort. So that's very useful to remember when you're a critic reading critics on you, the effort that is put in. There are very, even when you dissent very much from, um, from a work of literature or of art, of, of history, um, even when you dissent, disagree, there, there are ways of doing that. It might be very respectful. You might feel very stimulated, you know, so the dissent is, in fact, a mark of your interest. And then there's evisceration and the slash and the slam. And I, I know, I've sometimes done those. So it was, um, it was an interesting act of discipline, as well as for myself as a critic, as well as just, oh, what's happening? <laughs> you know, um, uh, being thrilled, flattered at times, and then being a little, um, oh, well, I, I don't think. I don't think that was fair, you know, getting a little aggressively defensive at other times. <laughs> it was very, it was very interesting. Yeah. It's always, a, it's always intriguing to be on both sides, you know? Right. Yeah. But, well, we've talked, we've talked about your life as a writer. Let's talk about your life as a teacher. Um, you teach, um, I've seen various the, references. Um, the School of the Arts. Um, Columbia has a, a graduate School of the Arts within which are um, programs in um, visual arts, um, theater, writing. Um, there's one more. What am I forgetting? Visual arts, theater, writing. Well, we'll leave it alone for now. Um, uh, and I am in the writing program, which has within that, um, the writing program is, you know, I think the first writing MFA program in the country may have been Iowa, University of Iowa, which is still quite famous and renowned. Um, But um, within our program, which is true of many MFA writing programs, there is a fiction concentration, a poetry concentration, and a nonfiction concentration. I am in nonfiction, and our program is very interested in all varieties of nonfiction from, say, the kinds that I largely do, which are criticism and memoir, to um, history, um, science, uh, you know, it just experimental essays, you know, personal, yeah, personal essays. Um, so it's, it's very, it's, it's very, I like it. It's very interesting. I also teach some, there is an undergraduate writing major, and um, I teach um, usually one grad- undergraduate course a year, too. So it's, um, you know, I, um, yeah, it's, it's in some ways, they feel, you know, so much like, you know, the next generation, like extensions of my generation, in other ways, they are wildly different, um, which is sometimes jarring, um, but genuinely intriguing. Um, no sense from one's writing students that you know, people are less interested in writing than before, but there are all these new forms. Um, you know, when when I was coming along, um, um, you know, rock and roll was still fairly young. I mean, it had kind of in its in its rock and roll incarnation, it had popped up in the fifties. It had plenty of antecedents. Um, rock and roll criticism um, was new. When I was a senior in college, um, I took the first film studies course I had ever taken. Film studies programs were only starting in the next few years. So, you know, there are all these 
disciplines and approaches also, you know, critical um, and scholarly approaches. There was not, um, there weren't African-American studies until the late 60s, early 70s. Um, ethnic studies, women's studies, um, queer studies, you know, they were all post-colonial, um, Africana. Um, you know, all of this is, is relatively new. Um, yes, I was, you know, coming, coming along as it was just starting a lot of these disciplines, and I was always supportive and interested, but, you know, they're a generation immersed also in, in media. Um, and, you know, students sometimes say to me, um, you know, can I write on, on gaming? You know, can I write an essay on gaming as something that's going to be an art form? And I say, if you can condense me, do it. Why, why not? You know, people used to think that television was never going to be an art form. Well, I, I, I'm interested in, in some of your thoughts on just the innovations in nonfiction. And I had kind of an interesting experience. I was at, attended a biographer's conference earlier this oh, year. Oh, yeah. But it was interesting because there was a discussion about the various ways that biography could be written. But there became a very heated discussion about a relatively recent biography by Edmund Morris of Ronald Reagan. Oh, my God, that one's still being argued, right? Right. Yeah. And the, the thrust is that he was given access to Reagan, I think mostly his second term, uh, you know, extraordinary access. Um, as Morris told it, he could not really quite figure Reagan out, so he ended up creating this fictional character to kind of observe Reagan and so forth. And this, this triggered some just fierce discussion in which several people said, the only contract we have in nonfiction is not to make stuff up. And mm -hmm. you can use, uh, you can be creative and use various devices, but you cannot make up someone and have him or her observe your subject. What is someone who's who encourages people to think creatively and push through boundaries? How do you react to that whole discussion? Okay, first of all, I do have to say I didn't I have not read the Edmund Morris. Boy, did I! I mean, I was interested in following all the ongoing debates because when did it come out? Not you know, it, I mean, the debate is several mid nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah hello. Um, you do you know there is historical fiction which is, I know that's a long, long standing and honorable medium. And it is based on, good historical fiction is based on very thorough research, but that's not what's fore, foregrounded. Um, sometimes the writers will list, you know, some of their, you know, researches, but it's not formal footnotes. Um, my feeling in, in general is, you have a kind of pact with the reader. This is what we often talk about um, in terms of uh, nonfiction, especially experimental, because even memoirists will tell you in a minute um, that they, first of all, who believes that we are literally quoting all that dialogue from so many years? You're recapturing it, you're retrieving it, you are to some extent re imagining or recreating it, let's say, you know, within a realistic frame. Um, there are memoirs who will say, um, okay, I've put two characters, two minor characters together, or I've uh, condensed time here. Um, I really believe that if, if that, if those are some of the things you're doing, or, you know, I'm, I'm, here's why I'm adding this character who is observing him. Here's what it is doing that my historical, more traditionally historical narrative isn't doing. And here's why I want it there. I think you the writer, absolutely owe the reader a very clear, uh, maybe it's your prologue, maybe it's your introduction, but it's a, in a sense a, akin to um, a historian's notes on method or methodology or why I'm, so I would say if, if you can convince me and I can trust, you know, your reasons for doing this, even if I disapprove, then I'm willing to go with you and consider it um, as you know, and maybe it isn't traditional history. Maybe we come up, and but it isn't historical fiction either, that book. So maybe we think about um, a different way of categorizing it. And then we really do kind of try to develop, um, you know, um, a, a template, a reasonable template for the expectations, um, you know, the requirements, the ways in which, again, you, you don't trick your reader. Professor Jefferson, let's go to some questions. We've gotten some wonderful questions emailed in. And the first comes from Jennifer from Chicago, who says, who asks, 
Please share your comments about Chicago's black community's relationship with Mayor Richard J. Daley. Now, you write about him. You write about the 1955 election and a, a poll in your class, and you broke with your parents and <laughs> talked well, no, about... Well, no, actually, my well, I lied. Um, everybody in the class was for Daley's um, opponent. This was his first election, who was a University of Chicago professor. Daley had, in those early days, in a city that, you know, was very con- segregated racially um, and somewhat punitive, Daley had made some canny... Um, alignments very early on with Black um, politicians and leaders, and he had made some promises. Um, Daily, for example, this sounds, you know, like it's not a big thing, but if you consider Chicago in those days, it was. Daily helped when Emmett Till was killed. Daily, again, for selfish reasons, politics. He intervened to make sure that Emmett Till's body would be brought back to Chicago so he could be displayed and buried the way his mother wanted to. There was, so he would do these symbolic and yet real um, things. He was a tyrant, you know, and it, it, be, it behooved him as he went on to only be interested in Black aldermen and other politicians who were backing every move of his, which by, was by no means um, advantageous for um, always for their black constituents. So by the time, you know, there was a, my, you know, my parents and their, and their crowd distanced themselves more and more, but, but also within that world, some of those aldermen who were dailyites were friends of theirs. One of them, Ralph Metcalf, who eventually broke away from daily was also a friend. So so, you know, it was tricky for my generation, you know, because we were, you know, we considered ourselves progressives, leftists, um, black power rights, you know, fierce civil rights, you know, by the time of the 68 convention, you know, when he was screaming, um, you know, anti-Semitic and racist insults and ordering the police in Chicago to shoot to maim. First, he said, shoot to kill, if I'm not mistaken. Then he said, shoot to maim. We, you know, that that was that. Then there were real breakaways that ultimately led to um, the election of Harold Washington. But it, it was, yeah, it, it was a um, very interesting path from um, Daly's um, practical offering of a certain number of rights on a landscape where there were very few to black, you know, to blacks, black communities in the 50s to his getting more and more ruthless, reckless. I mean, who else was presiding over um, urban removal? Uh, you know, to his just not giving a damn and, you know, being contemptuous. A question from Lorraine in Carbondale, and it's a topic that you discuss in your book. She, she, she writes, I'm a Caucasian who remembers and appreciated the mag- magazines Jet and Ebony <laughs> and was very sorry when, like so many other national magazines, they ceased publication. Do they have a role in your family's life? And if so, in what ways? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, they arrived every week. Um, yes. And there was another magazine that we didn't get that they that the Johnsons uh, also produced, Sepia. But Ebony and Jet, absolutely. Um, read through them. Um, again, you know, it's that interesting doubleness that I talked about. Of course, Life magazine and, you know, other more mainstream white magazines were arriving. So I used to find it. I think I said that in the book. So interesting and sometimes baffling to see like who the say the movie star on the cover of Life was um, always white and who the one on the cover of Ebony was. And sometimes the one on the cover of Ebony, you know, I could, would know that no white friend of mine in school would have heard of this person. You know? And yet at other times, if it was Lena Horne or Sammy Davis Jr., world famous. No, they were, they were, they were delightful and, and they were comforting and reassuring. Um, and they were all the, that world, my family, they were all very proud of, of Johnny and Eunice Johnson for, for doing it. You know, that was a, a, a total sign of, you know, how we can help change the landscape. I wish they were still around. They do have a, you should know their archives, you know, and you can look up pieces that you want, but I, I wish I wish there was still a role for them. Yeah. Holly from Carbondale writes about um, your your writing and says, "What is your advice for best writing strategies, practices, and what are your personal writing hurdles, and how do you overcome these struggles?" 
well, best practices, um, do it um, as many, do it as often as you can. Find a time. If it can't be every day, you know, it's all right. But set um, set a time of the day, you know, when when it works for you. We all have different, you know, um, <laughs> um, systems. Um, you know, you, I, I, some people are great in the morning. Some people are really good at night. So do that and try to do it quite regularly, whether it's a story you're working on or an essay or, um, you know, just recording a scene you saw in your house or at your place of work um, or notebooks you're keeping, you know, with observations as well as thoughts. Um, keep at it. Um, re -re give yourself a little time when it's done. Um, then go back and reread it and ask yourself, um, okay, where, am, where is it a little confusing? You know, where, what does it feel like I'm evading or avoiding something? I promise you, you'll be able to see that. Or why did, why are there so many words here? Why are there like three adjectives? Do I need, need all three of them? So you're looking for um, cl clarity of expression. You're looking for words that really, they don't communicate huge generalizations. Um, like, that movie was so beautiful. Um, okay, what do you mean by beautiful? Give me, give me some specifics. Let me see and feel those qualities. So always look for that. Um, and um, also in terms of your hurdles, um, it can take me a long time to get to the emotional heart of what I'm saying. I'm good at um, intellectualizing it. So, you know, that's in some way for me always a hurdle. Um, I like using a lot of words. Um, it's just fun for me. And that can be, you know, continuing to be willing, whether I do it myself or give it to a friend who's got good taste to, you know, let some words go um, and maybe not show off so or hide behind them. You'll, you'll be able to identify your hurdles as you develop the habit of rereading yourself and revising and rewriting. And also nothing wrong with imitating as exercises, the way art students go into a museum and you know, do this painting after such and such artists. You know, what writers do you really like and why? And tr you know, tr what are the elements of their style? And let me do an imitation of that and see what happens. You know, be, be a, being a good writer or being a developing writer means also really reading for, um, in an active way. Um, well, I was going to go there because I see plenty of books behind you, and I suspect there's plenty more in your home. Tell me about the importance of, of a book reading, and what, what sort of books do you like to read? Um, do you have sort of one part of your brain is just total relaxation and escapism, and the other is more kind of serious and... Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good division. And then within that, you know, there are different kinds of escapism and different kinds of seriousness. Um, you know the seriousness of a poet I like is also a kind of just pleasurable letting the mind and senses go in many, many ways. The seriousness right now I'm reading, I don't know why it took me so long, um, that uh, uh, The Sympathizer, which is a very interesting, beautifully written and dense novel about um, the Vietnam War, I will say to me. You know, that requires, I have to concentrate, you know, but it is also, like being in a very, you know, like those old books we used to read, like Victor Hugo, the, you know, these big, big adventures. Um, but, but, or yeah, like also like interesting um, and somewhat grim, but fascinating character study and, you know, war story. So it's, it's, it's fascinating, but it, it is, it is work. I like different kinds of thrillers. Um, I like procedurals. Um, um, I've read a lot of them, um, <laughs> you know, some of them, there are, there's some, um, writers who, you know, they're fascinating the way they plot and also they have a real voice. There are others when I just want a good plot, you know, you're thinking, oh, this is, this is corny writing, but the plot's carrying me along. Okay. So, you know, it really just depends on one's moods and one needs and what you need a break from. Um, when I was a full-time book reviewer, um, you know, whatever I didn't have to underline you know, was was very felt like relaxation, even if it was a hard book. Now I'm I'm pretty eclectic, yeah. Well, let me ask you finally, we could go on for many more hours and we hope to, to entice you down here at some point. But I'm sure this is a question you get asked a lot. 
New York City versus Chicago. And how are the two cities alike? How are they different? Um, what are the, and then also when you come back to Chicago, where do you like to visit? Do you like to see the old neighborhood? Um, or is it better to just go to other places? No, it's good. It's good to do both. It's, you know, it's coming back to Chicago has been a little strange since, um, you know, both my parents are gone. Um, and I still do have some friends there, but a lot of even my old friends are in other cities now. Um, so I, you know, a combination, I, I need the new as well as the old. I like to see how the city has developed, you know, and, and in which way it's fun to look at often Chicago, um, not every part of it, but so, you know, I, I like to be a tourist, but it's basically when I come back and it's been, been a while, um, I like to be both a tourist and, um, um, like an, like an immigrant returning. Um, I like both Chicago was, um, much the rhythm is very different from New York, at least the rhythm I grew up in. Um, not only does this have to do with so many, you know, you drive a lot more places, but this, the streets were much wider than New York streets. You know, you could stroll with a bigger sense of space. Um, sometimes they were quieter. Um, there were, you know, there were more trees. <laughs> you know? All of that was very pleasant. But my sister and I um, both wanted to be in the arts. Chicago now has an amazing arts scene, meaning a lot of choices. Chicago always got really good things, but it didn't, there weren't nearly as many theater companies. You know, there wasn't, um, um, a, you know, a really developed museum of contemporary art. There weren't, you know, various museums and I think DuSable Museum hadn't um, been built yet. So, you know, there's just a huge amount more, you know, Chicago is really claimed, um, you know, its space in many places beyond just um, music and architecture. Um, and I'm proud of that. I needed New York because there has always been, this is before lockdown, some sense that, you know, anything can happen. Any new new art form or new group of people can, can show up. Um, yeah. Well, before we let you go, we, we, I know you have a new book also, coming out in February. More. Tell us. Oh, yes, I will. Okay. It is both memoir. Actually, it's coming out later now. It's coming out because um, I had some editorial. I changed editors, etc. It's coming out at the very beginning of May. It's called, it's a combination of um, criticism, or I should say writing intimately about um artists and, and art objects and, you know, records and movies and singers and um, all sorts of things, but writing very intimately about them and linking them to memoir. Um, some, of, some of the memoir is, you know, very much built on character and, and you know, my family, but it all, you know, some of it is filtered through, for example, our listening to um, Bud Powell records and Ella Fitzgerald records and, you know, coding what my parents said about, what my father said about Bud Powell and, and what that had to do with also black masculinity as well as genius. Um, and my own um, um, anxieties about um, Ella Fitzgerald as, as a genius, but, not at, but as not glamorous at a time when, you know, I craved um, you know, seeing glamorous, glamorous, glamorous black men. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's, there's that mixture um, of the, the personal in the, in the psychological and social way um, and, the, and, and the arts as a, as a vehicle for um, self-revelation. It's it is, called constructing a nervous system. That's what I was going to say. I wanted to make sure that our, our viewers uh, go out to bookstores this uh, in May and and constructing track a nervous it. system colon a memoir. Um, so keep your eye out for it. Yeah, thank Great. you for that. That was very nice. Well, our pleasure, and thank you so much for your amazing energy and wisdom and just sheer fun. I mean, this has been a really delightful interview. And as I was uh, saying beforehand. If there's a way when you come back to Chicago, we could coax you down to Southern Illinois and show you a different part of the state. You know, uh -huh. I'm sure the students would love to meet you. And maybe when your book comes out, we can arrange some let's, kind of event down let's here. Talk about it because this was really a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and thank you, those of you who sent in questions. I appreciate it too. But thank you for, you know, your, your vigor and preparation. And, you know, yeah. 
<laughs> Sounds good. That's great. And your questions. Yep. Thanks so much. Well, okay. thanks. Okay. For- Thanks bye for bye. coming, everybody. <laughs> bye. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for watching another edition of Understanding, or excuse me, Illinois Authors. Um, yeah, and please pursue uh, uh, Professor Jefferson's books. They're all, both of them are amazing. And I'm sure her third book will be equally amazing. And also track down her writing on the on the internet. You can find the, uh, the essays that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1995. They're all worth reading. So thank you for joining us and thank you for keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks Very so happy to, proud to do that and to be an Illinois author. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye.